Good evening. It's good to be back. Not that we've been away for very long. A match of the day will be a regular fixture on Saturday night for the entire football season. It's only when the champions play the cup winners at Wembley that you know for sure competitive football has returned. Arsenal and Manchester United attracted over 65,000 fans for today's Charity Shield game. It was a great family afternoon at Wembley and a real opportunity for a new generation of fans to see in the flesh some of the real stars that play in British football. For incisive comment and analysis, the name of Hansen was one of the first on the match of the day retain list. Contract negotiations were tense though. And we're delighted to have secured on loan from club management the former Manchester United and England winger Steve Coppel. I understand pre-season went very well on the golf course. So here we go with the 93-94 football season. Arsenal v Manchester United, Trevor Brooking and John Watson in the commentary box. Those who feel football comes around too quickly won't find too many takers at Wembley today. The crowd for the Charity Shield looks to be approaching 70,000 and there's a buzz around the stadium as the fans take their first look at the English game's most expensive player. Roy Keane, who cost Manchester United three and three quarter million pounds this summer from Nottingham Forest, and who takes his place in the champion starting lineup at number nine. Brian Robson has been named as a substitute. Andre Kanchelskis at number five and Eric Cantona at number seven are both selected, so the likes of Brian McClare and Lee Sharp are with Robson on the bench. Now, while United are lining up 1-11, to cup holders Arsenal are wearing the squad numbers and names on the shirts, which will be adopted in the Carling Premiership this season. So, Anders Limpar, back in favour in the starting lineup, wears number 15, and John Jensen in midfield is number 17. And new signing Eddie McGoldrick is among the Arsenal substitutes. And the referee for the FA Charity Shield is Gerald Ashby from Worcester. So as the curtain goes up officially on the English season, it's Arsenal in yellow, Manchester United in red, and opening thoughts from Trevor Brooking. Well, the Charity Shield uh, couldn't be uh, between uh, two strong sides, could they? I mean, Arsenal had success last season, Manchester United eventually ending uh, that long wait for their league championship. Uh, a lot of good big names on show and also a lot on the bench, so a lot of competition for places in both sides. Yes, two substitutes allowed today, and if the scores are level at the end of 90 minutes, then we have a penalty shootout, no extra time. And Andy Linegan, who scored that last-minute winner in the cup final, just feeding Lee Dixon there. There's a flag up already on the far side. Free kick. Fans have come early for a lunchtime kickoff, and they're in good voice on a sunny afternoon forward by Pallister that's Cantona finds Ince Fall into had such an outstanding season last time round, and of course got a new partner this year with Roy Keane starting off alongside him in place of Brian McClare, who has to sit patiently on the bench. Little shove there by Pallister on right, and Kevin Campbell has made a very good run, and he's got past Schmeichel. And Campbell, a player of whom George Graham has high hopes this season, he believes that his Schmeichel complaining uh, but he believes the Arsenal manager that Campbell's best time may be just ahead of him this is Giggs Ince is in the centre Cantona's joining him Giggs again Irwin outside and Cantona lifting it back in oh that's a typical volley by Mark Hughes Manchester United take the lead and Mark Hughes very much the sort of chance that he thrives on overlapping 
on the outside by Dennis Irwin here, picking it up from Giggs, far post cross, two players over there really, Cantona, lovely skill, lofted it up, Hughes, a cracking volley. That was good build-up play, wasn't it? Dennis Irwin with his left foot did very well, hits it deep, goes beyond Linigan, Cantona, deft little first touch and finds Hughes who kept it down very well. At this stage it looks as if the danger is going to be cleared but Arsenal didn't pick up and as the ball's knocked back in it'll be a bit disappointed to see Mark Hughes having a yard or two of space to hook the ball in. No better volleyer of the ball in that position than the Welsh international Mark Hughes. And Schelskis. Now then, his first contribution already a telling one. Wearing number seven. Oh, look at that. Brilliant pass, and goodness, it's Roy Keane away from David Seaman. Giggs coming in from the far side. Hughes is there too. Keane again. And Cantona in the middle, saved by Seaman. Exciting stuff from the Manchester United attack, and newcomer Keane very much involved there from Cantona's pass. I think Cantona seems to enjoy the charity shield, didn't they? Look, when you think back to last season's hat-trick, they're a, a terrific ball. Keane making one of those typical runs of his they've seen so often for Nottingham Forest. He looks up there, bides his time, waits for people to join, gets blocked on the first one, but then he actually does very well, picks out Cantona, and Seaman, to his credit, blocks that shot well. A second goal at that stage would have been a bad blow. This is Merson. Outside in his winter burn. Oh, and Schmeichel didn't gather that and needed the help of Steve Bruce. To be fair to Peter Schmeichel, I think you'll find that just change direction. Merson to take the corner then. Adams comes in with the keeper here. Corner again. Big problem there for any defence with uh, Adams and Linigan threatening. That was given away by Winterburn and Roy Keane saw the chance to get Kanchelskis away. Now Cantona's coming speeding in from the other side of the pitch. And that's a terrific looking ball to find him. I'm not sure the shot was on goal, but anyway, it caught John Jensen and went out for a corner. But a sweeping move by Manchester United. Well, a typical Manchester United move, wasn't it? A counter-attack. Kanchelska's got great pace once he gets away from defenders like that, but the final ball was terrific, right on the foot of Cantona, which got blocked. It's all a bit tight in there, but... Uh... Finally, Linigan with the more orthodox ball and a good one to Ian Wright. Now he's got Merson in the middle and Campbell in a great position here. Missed it completely. Well, that was an opportunity for Arsenal, the best they've had, I would say. But they're in possession again with uh, Jensen, Dixon, Campbell. Limpart, Davis, Jensen, and now Winterburn. How good a chance was that when uh, Wright rolled that one back into Campbell's path? Well, it was a pretty good chance, I think. Uh, Kevin Campbell nearly not making any contact. As you can see, right along the floor, he actually hits his standing foot. He misses it with his right foot completely. Uh, we'll put it down to early season rustiness, I think. It's a nice touch by Eric Cantona, found Kanchelskis, Hughes, Cantona, that's asking a little much of him. The one thing he isn't is a sprinter, but uh, his deft touches have lit up for people like Hughes this opening half hour. It's so great to bring in other people into the game, and the terrific thing from the United and in Cantona's point of view is he's got so many options in this side because there's so many people wanting to get forward. 
Here's Campbell getting forward for Arsenal. Goes away from Bruce, then takes on Irwin. A good run by Campbell. Oh, rolled it across. And there was no Arsenal player on the six-yard line to knock that in. Here's Davis. And that was Campbell again in the build-up. Limpar showing some trickery. And trying to curl Schmeichel. And that was one Scandinavian trying to outwit another. Anders Limpar of Sweden curling it towards the far post and beyond, as his gesture implied. And uh, Peter Schmeichel, Trevor, would he have that covered? I would have thought so. It was good effort and uh, shows the sort of dribbling skill that he has got. This was Kanchelskis. Hughes is in the centre and there are two or three other United players making tracks. It's still Kanchelskis and it's a free kick against Winterburn. Kanchelskis is such a great outlet, isn't he? He's only gets to have a half a yard on anyone and, and then he streaks right close to the touchline, going towards the corner, really does stretch defences. Just wonder what Giggs might have in mind here, Trevor, with his left foot. Whatever it was, it was blocked. Here he is again. And that's Ince. Oh. I'm not sure that, that would have been a goal. The linesman seemed to me to be flagging to, a, to say there was another Manchester United player offside. It would have been a shame if it had gone in and then not counted. Well, I wouldn't like to see this sort of shot penalised. There was somebody fractionally offside out wide, but uh, to me, he's got nothing to do with interfering or, or sort of blocking the view of the goalkeeper. And it was a well-struck shot, and as you say, just as well, it didn't fly in the net and the, the flag put to question. Davis. Oh, right, was it? Oh, what a tremendous shot. Ian Wright equalises for Arsenal, and if Mark Hughes provided a typical goal at one end, then that flourish from Ian Wright was every bit as good. It might even have been better. It would have to be Wright, wouldn't it? The header is by Davis, the turn is by Wright, and what a ferocious volley from outside the penalty area, Trevor. Well, it was much better, wasn't it? I mean, it's only a half a chance, and this is an instinctive finishing, hooking it on, and from the minute he left his foot, it was in the corner. Magnificent goal. He seems to do so well for Arsenal at Wembley, doesn't he, Ian Wright? And just look at that, Schmeichel rooted to the spot, not an earthly. Space here, Campbell in the middle, Merson near post, Irwin away. Come back well, haven't they, Arsenal, after what I thought the first 25, 30 minutes went to Manchester United, they went 1-0 up, and then Ian Wright's goal, and, and, and suddenly they got a yard or so quicker, and they're finishing the stronger as it comes up to half-time. There's Campbell. Back again to Limpar. Adams and Linnigan are still there. So was Pallister. And Kanchelskis didn't make that. Here's Winterburn. Davis. Merson. And again, trying to play the one-two with Wright. A little bit too elaborate, maybe, but this is not. This is Cantona picking... Oh, look at the running here by Giggs and also by Kanchelskis, number five. And if... Oh, wasn't far away from just feeding it inside two gigs. Another great attack. Right, Campbell. There wasn't too much charity around there. John Jensen's the player on the floor. But um, there's an edge to the game. It certainly isn't a stroll.
free kick to Arsenal, Davis to take it Campbell's there it's a good free kick uh, Tony Adams spun out and was free beyond Kevin Campbell you see it whips in goes on to the head of Kevin Campbell and just behind him out picture was Tony Adams and a bit of freedom as well they do work hard on those free kicks Arsenal see Adams here just at the far post got beyond Steve Bruce there's Mercy good movement again but uh, Kanchelskis had uh, gone back with Ian Wright gave Schmeichel a rather awkward kick there this is Davis Winterburn gets away from Parker. Oh, nice distribution to Keane. Well, the season is only 45 minutes old, but we've already had two goals to remember. Mark Hughes with a falling volley, which put Manchester United in front on eight minutes, and Ian Wright with an even more spectacular effort from the edge of the penalty area in the 41st minute, making the half-time score. Champions Manchester United won, cup holders Arsenal won. Half-time substitution by Arsenal. Martin Keown, who rejoined them last season from Everton for some £2 million, is on in place of Lee Dixon, who sustained an ankle injury in the first half. This is the 20th Charity Shield match at Wembley since the event was moved here in 1974. Manchester United start the second half on the attack. Ince fouled. First one. First Charity Shield here ended in a penalty shootout between Liverpool and Leeds. And this one could end that way if the scores remain level. So in very uh, dangerous set pieces, not one or two spectacular goals last season. That one, I think, too far out to trouble Davis Seaman. The official attendance at Wembley, 66,519. A very good crowd for this curtain raiser. Pallister takes the free kick. Merson the long ball. Pallister being stretched here by Kevin Campbell. Good play by Campbell. That is when Kevin Campbell is at his best. Uh, as I say, last season was one where he just couldn't seem to find his form. The season before, when he had those balls, he was so strong and went past defenders. He did well against Pallister there. Got a good shot in. Ince. Two very good efforts we've seen from Paul Ince. Well, he's alternating with Roy Keane at the moment, uh, taking it in turns to get forward, which is good. I mean, they're both good attacking players. Uh, Paul Ince sometimes last season held quite a lot because Brian McClare was the one going forward all the time, whereas today at the moment he's alternating with Keane on those forward runs. In the meantime, Ryan Giggs is going off to be replaced by Brian Robson. The club captain, whose appetite for the game is as good as ever, and who's prepared, he says, to fight it out for a place this season. Well, we thought that maybe it would be Robson for Keane. It looks like Robson and Keane and Ince on the pitch now. Oh, Cantona! Good challenge, Winterburn. Had to be. Again, Hughes. Arsenal just hanging on a bit there. And uh, Ian Wright's crossfield pass is intercepted by Paul Parker. And he was checked as he came through by Campbell. That's a free kick to United, about 30 yards out.
there you see Adams and Linigan pushing off to play the offside and Winterburn did well to cover. And Kanchelski shoots. And the way that hit the advertising board, I don't think it was too far away. We don't often see Kanchelskis sort of dismiss the other United players and get a chance to have a shot on target. I must say, I haven't seen him hit many as hard as he hits this one, but he strikes it perfectly, just whizzes past the post. Now a substitution. We're going to see Arsenal's new signing. Off goes Anders Limpar, and on comes Eddie McGoldrick. Who was signed from Crystal Palace and can operate as a midfield player or indeed Palace used him as a sweeper at times last season and he's uh, probably better known earlier in his career as a wide man so uh, he's come on for Limpa well it's a quarter of an hour to go of the 90 minutes and if it doesn't uh, seem far-fetched at this stage of the season it'll be a penalty shootout unless we get a goal because there's no extra time and the second half has certainly not been as vibrant as the first. <laughs> Davis touching it out to Ian Wright. Bruce is the defender. He's good in these positions right normally. Campbell following up, but not today. It's a fairly feeble effort by his standards. At the other end, Cantona rushes Linigan to one side, slows it up to beat Limpar. Still, ca oh, that's terrific, and Keane's coming in. A chance for United, and Cantona still with Kanchelskis behind him. Oh, good stuff from the Frenchman. Deserved a bit better, really. Yeah, initially, he's turned Linigan very well, then he, he turns back out past the two defenders. I think he's going to try and lift this one to Mark Hughes, actually. But in fact, it clears both Hughes and Winterburn, who was covering, goes to Keane, who gets a break inside and an excellent save by Seaman. And of course, it's then turned back in and the shot blocked. Here comes Paul Ince, and the tackle was by John Jensen. Manchester United go towards the referee, asking for a penalty. Ince, in particular, feels affronted, but nothing has been given. Now, here's the first tricky call of the season for you, Trevor. Well, Paul Ince is past Jensen, isn't he? Does he make contact with the ball? No, he doesn't. And although Paul Ince might well have been looking for the penalty, look, you see again, does the defender make contact? No, he brings Ince down, and for me, 100% penalty, but it's not given. Ah, there we are then. There's our first argument of 1993-94. No penalty given, so play continues with Arsenal on the attack. Here's Merson. Oh, that's right. He doesn't take any backlift at all, does he? It comes out of nothing. And Schmeichel was ready for it. Another great shot on the turn. Straight to Schmeichel, though, this occasion. The United fans are still booing the decision at the other end, but it's a corner to be taken by McGoldrick. And here comes Linigan. Oh, and Wright was in front of the keeper, and so was Adams. And how that one stayed out, well, I think Michael can tell us that. He was a busy boy in there. Andy Linegan obviously liking this end as far as corner kicks. Of course, the cup final must have sprung in his mind there. And Schmeichel just <laughs> arrogantly picks this one out with one hand. Some good keeping in there because uh, Wright was looking to convert Linegan's header from close range. Here's Hughes. Cantonard Square. Oh, he didn't get the angle on the pass, Mark Hughes. So the Charity Shield match ends 1-1. Hughes and Wright the scorers and now the teams must take penalty kicks to decide who wins just bring back memories of three years ago when Spurs and Arsenal drew nil-nil here in the charity shield and it was shared six months each club that used to be the way it was done 
quite whether we need to have a prolonged penalty shootout at this stage of what's going to be a very long season. I'm not entirely convinced. From my recollection, David Seaman, the Arsenal goalkeeper, has a good record in penalty shootouts. He saved three, I believe, at Millwall last season in a League Cup tie. And he has to face the first one today from Manchester United's Paul Ince. So he puts it away with some aplomb. 1-0 to United. Well, never any problem as soon as the keeper's gone the wrong way there. Safely home. A little bit of history here. Nigel Winterburn will want to forget that he missed a penalty at that end at Wembley in a very important cup final against Luton Town. He's taking this one against Peter Schmeichel, who conveniently for him went to his left and let the shot go down the centre of the goal. Bit of a smile running back because it was a bad penalty, wasn't it? A bobbler, but fortunately, Smeichel had left the middle of the net. Well, last season, I think, uh, one of our live FA Cup ties, Steve Bruce hit the post, didn't he, against Sheffield United from the spot? Here he is now against Seaman. Oh, and when the chance came, he made no mistake. Well, the regular penalty taker is worth waiting for. David Seaman the right way, but no chance of a touch. Well, next for Arsenal is John Jensen, who's never actually scored for the club. He might, in one sense, do so now. But it's Denmark against Denmark, isn't it? Made no difference. 2-2. Two -two. John Jensen going for power. Wasn't that much in the corner, but the power took him just underneath Michael's outstretched hand. Dennis Irwin for Manchester United. Oh, good save by Seaman. Well, that will give Arsenal the edge if they score the next one. Seaman goes the right way, it was a good strike by Owen, but just the height for Seaman to get his hands and push it wide. Well, Kevin Campbell comes forward now. Didn't hesitate there. All there. Arsenal lead by three goals to two, and each team have taken three penalties. Again, Schmeichel goes one way, and fortunately for Kevin Campbell, the ball goes the other. Now the £3.75 million pound newcomer Roy Keane in his first full game for United. Shouldn't think he felt we'd be into penalties at this stage of the season, but uh, we are. And here's the outcome. Oh, straight down the middle. Well, that's 3-3, but Arsenal have a kick in hand. That was probably the worst struck of the four penalties for United. But it was through the middle, and David Seaman had gone to his left. Next man to come forward for Arsenal is Paul Merson. Well, Schmeichel knows the pressure's on him now. He did save one from Van Basten memorably in the European Championships. But he won't save that one, and Merson makes it 4-3 for Arsenal. So United have to score the next one, otherwise Arsenal have won. And it's going to be Cantona. Well, this is the man who wrote the headlines on the Charity Shield Day last year with his hat-trick for Leeds United against Liverpool. Today it's down to the Frenchman to save the day, or keep it going anyway. Cantona can't afford to miss.
Well, he rolled that against the stanchion. Well, one of the penalties looks as if it's taken on the training ground. A little stroll up into the corner. That's that one out the way. Now we come to something of a climax, because if Ian Wright scores, Arsenal have won the charity shield. And he's got a fine record in club football at Wembley. So we'll see if he can end proceedings here. Don't forget he scored twice from the spot in South Africa against the same goalkeeper two weeks ago. What does Schmeichel learn from that? <laughs> and he's put it wide. So it remains at 4-4. Well, that was the script written, wasn't it? Well wide of the post. And I suppose having scored that spectacular equaliser, he was destined to miss the penalty. So of the ten penalties taken, eight were scored and two were missed. Irwin for United and Wright for Arsenal failed to score. So we now start what is uh, traditionally known as sudden death. It's now shot for shot. And Brian Robson has come forward to take the first in the second sequence against David Seaman. Five-four United. I know the players who are in the sudden death ones always think they'll never have to take them, so Brian Robson, I'm sure, quite relieved to put his in the corner away from Seaman. Look at this, David Seaman himself here, shades of 74 when David Harvey took one against Ray Clements. It's going to be Seaman who has to score to keep Arsenal in the competition. And the other goalkeeper knew too much. And Manchester United have won the FA Charity Shield on penalty kicks. Brian Robson's kick in the end was decisive, so that's a, a nice moment for him. But in the end, I don't think anybody else on the Arsenal side really wanted to take one. Certainly nobody pushed Seaman out of the way. <laughs> and so the charity shield is settled in a penalty shootout. The final score in the match was 1-1. The final score on penalties alone was Manchester United 5, Arsenal 4. Former England captain Billy Wright, now director at Wolves, handed over the charity shield to Steve Bruce and Peter Schmeichel. A gate of over 65,000 generated good gate receipts. That's good news for the charities that will benefit. And well done to Manchester United, who flew the flag for Britain's bid to host the Olympic Games in 2000. It was a good day for Manchester. Today, I think it showed that we still need one or two games. I think one or two of, of our players still need the matches. Uh, we started well and then started giving the ball away. Then we come back and wait in the game and we could have won it. But um, at, the, at the end of the day, Despite winning and the, the penalty kicks, I still feel there's two or three of our players needed that game today. Funnily, I mean, funnily enough, I mean, I actually didn't know there was, a, was going to be a penalty shootout today. Uh, I just thought uh, it was going to come at the end of the match and it was going to be shared again, like we did two years ago at Tottenham. Uh, it may sound a bit strange saying that now, but I think it was such a close game today, and I think the, the score line, uh, the 1 1, reflected the, sort of the game, the, the way the game went. I thought it was very close, I didn't think anybody particularly deserved to win it. And it's just, for the charity shield, I think really that I wouldn't have minded uh, sharing it this time again, like we did against Spurs two years ago. David, I think a lot of people were probably surprised to see you step up and take a penalty. Yeah, that's right. Um, I nearly took one in the first five, but uh, I think it was John Jensen decided he'd take one. So, like, our coach says, oh, no, I'll let the lads take it, you know, and then if it goes to sudden death, you take one. So you actually volunteered, did you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you always mess about, you know, like the goalkeepers love taking penalties in training. And, uh, I just fancied one. But you were disappointed to see it saved? Oh, definitely. You know, especially I didn't hit it right as well. You can hit them better than that, can you? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that United goal really illustrated part, part of the reason for your success last season, perhaps, the, the, the part that somebody like Eric Cantona can, can play in the, the build-up to. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think um, everybody uh, uh, realises the importance that Eric uh, has on the team. Um, He's, uh, he's very aware of everything about him and uh, I've certainly benefited from the fact that he's come to our club. Um, I'm able to, to get in the box more and uh, I know that uh, if I make 
any kind of decent run, Eric's uh, likely to pick me up. I was pleased to score, you know, I thought we were playing well. Um, Man United started very fast, they looked really sharp. And, um, you know, when they did score, I thought we weathered it for a while and then we got our own goal, which was really good because I thought on, on a, over the 90 minutes, I thought we had the more chances. And uh, it's just unfortunate we didn't put them away, maybe. Have you decided which colour Manchester United play in yet? I haven't got a clue. I've, played in, uh, I've just been told I've played in all the strips. <laughs> but as long as I'm in the first 11, I don't care what we wear. So you've played four games and each time you've worn a different shirt, is that right? Yeah. But as I said, it doesn't bother me what we wear as long as I'm in the first 11. There's no way that they were going to overrun us and they weren't going to dominate us for 90 minutes. Likewise, there was no way we were going to sort of dominate them for 90 minutes. And that's how close uh, I think the championship's going to be this year. You kick off the season as champions. What, what, what do you see as the requirements for Manchester United? Hunger. Just plain hunger. Determination to succeed. And if I've got that, the players have a great chance. Both managers sound encouraged. If you were part of the Arsenal management team, what would you have noticed from today? Well, I think they'll be happy. I thought they played very well on the day. They've got a system of play that's been highly successful. Their only problem might come is that they rely heavily on Ian Wright's goals. If these goals were to dry up or he was seriously injured, then it's difficult to see where the goals would come from. What he needs is a partner up front that's going to get his share of goals. Kevin Campbell was his partner today and he actually played very well on the day. But unfortunately for him and Arsenal, he never looked really like scoring. This is a typical Arsenal move, ball over the top, right onto it quick. Even he can't score from there, but he holds up well. Campbell comes in, mistimes it, and a good chance goes astray. But this is what he was doing a couple of years ago. Pace and aggression takes him past first Bruce, then Irwin. Gets near to the byline, good ball back in. I thought Ian Wright, would, have, if he had been in possession there, he would have shot. But look, there's five United players in there, only one Arsenal player. But another good pass from Campbell. Wright hits it quick, but again, it's Wright that's hitting the target there. And this man is virtually a goal-scoring machine. This goal he scores today is goal of the season before the season actually started. It's a fa fantastic goal. Schmeichel cannot believe it. He's got no right to score from that position. The United marking wasn't bad, but he just hits it in the turn. This is from behind the goals. Just unbelievable. A great shot. Schmeichel just cannot believe his luck. Steve, when you were manager at Crystal Palace, you brought Ian Wright into the game. You know him inside out. What sort of player do you need to partner Ian Wright? Well, two things I think you need. First and foremost, you need to be a good player. Ian Wright is a great player and he doesn't suffer fools gladly. And secondly, I think you need to be a strong personality. Um, as we've seen, Ian is uh, verbally very demanding and if you aren't a strong personality, uh, you'll crumble and you won't be able to take the heat. We've sat here and talked about Ian Wright's temperament many times. What do you do to try and tap that, can you? Well, he, from what I can see, is exactly the same personality from when he first walked in at uh, our training ground at, at Crystal Palace. And I think if you tried to change him, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get the same player. He needs that fire in his belly. I wouldn't try and change him at all, just leave him. Are you surprised that he's become well, one of the leading strikers in the game? I'm delighted, a little bit surprised. When he first came, he had the ability, there was no doubt about that, right from day one. But to have achieved as much as he has, I have to say I'm a little bit surprised. So we know Arsenal might be able to score goals, but they look equipped to, to stop them at the back. David Seaman looked good today. He's playing great. He had a great season last season. A couple of years back, he had a bad time, but he's back to top-class form. He really is the best keeper in the country. And he, he does well here because he comes off his line quickly and he takes Keane wide. But you watch him when he goes back in his line. Keane's got the ball. Watch him on his line. He's alive, alert. He's aware of every possibility. And when eventually he stops it, he reacts quicker than anybody else and gets up and saves it and that's top class. United on the attack here, they've got a man over. Roy Keane comes inside. Again, Seaman's angle's great, and the save really is fantastic. And they say that a good goalkeeper is worth 12 points a season. Had a hernia operation this summer. He's obviously recovered well. He has done. The only blemish in an otherwise perfect performance was the penalty kick, wasn't it? I mean, I could have saved that. But... Steve, you played in a great United side in the 70s. What do you make now of Manchester United 1993? Well, a couple of things struck me today, and to echo Mark Hughes, if we look at the two seamen saves there through the eyes of Eric Cantona, we can see and appreciate his value to the team. He picks the ball up wide here, and he plays a great ball through to Roy Keane, a typical Roy Keane run, but it's Cantona's space that he's taken. Uh, Roy Keane then gets uh, a second chance at a cross, lays the ball back, and the man who's there to finish it, have a good strike, is Eric Cantona. The second incident, he picks the ball up, he shows his strength, holds off Linnigan, and then you see his vision. 
wonderful vision. I'm not sure whether he actually meant this chip, but it lands up Roy Keane's feet. He comes inside, shoots, and there's the man again on the end of it, Eric Cantona. And I'm sure we're going to see that combination score a few goals this season. The other thing which struck me as an old Manchester United winger, how pleasing it was to see the, the wingers pick up the ball and stay wide to deliver early crosses. Ryan Giggs there, and this typical Manchester United move on the defence one moment, defending a corner. They pick the ball up. Ball goes to Kinchelskis, who again, I love to see him stay wide, drags the defender across, hits a great ball for Eric Cantona once again to have a strike. And finally, with the goal, Giggs picks it up, wants to play an early cross, gets a second bite, lays it out wide again, Dennis Irwin hits a terrific cross. Another piece of Cantona magic and a typical Mark Hughes volley. As an old Manchester United winger, did it make you want to get your boots set again? Well, <laughs> I've been thinking that a few times since I left. Now, United have got a strong squad, obviously, but do you see any chinks? Is there anything that will concern Alex Ferguson? Well, they do have great strength and depth, but the one thing which might just concern me a little bit is if any of the defenders get injured, then they have to... Uh, move Paul Parker around, and they, they don't appear to have the proven strength and depth at the back. Well, it went to a penalty shootout, but it could have been settled on a penalty within the 90 minutes. A John Jensen challenge on Paul Ince? Yeah, definitely. The ball's laid into Mark Hughes, who flicks it into Ince's path. The challenge from Jensen. If Jensen makes contact, then it's not a penalty. Well, we see it from behind the goals, and it's evident that Jensen doesn't make contact and it should have been a penalty kick. It's a difficult one to call early on in the season. Perhaps a third umpire should have been there. Eh? Early in the season, you're up to speed already on match well, referees. Thank you, thanks. <laughs> Steve, I must say, you were a long time as the manager at Crystal Palace, nine years. We've enjoyed hearing you tonight, but might we hear you again in the near future as a manager? Well, I, I am a manager. I still see that as my occupation, but realistically, I can't see myself uh, getting a job from October, November at the earliest. So I'll be hanging around for a while yet. Available if the phone rings? Definitely, definitely. Seeing two good teams there today, do you see Manchester United retaining their, their title? You championed them all last season. I think they're strong favourites. They really have got quality players. They've got strength and depth. I think they'll take a lot of stopping. Steve, would you go along with that? Well, I'm going to upset a few United people and say my tip would be Liverpool. I just think the distraction of Europe for both United and Arsenal will be too great, and I just think uh, Liverpool will, will take the title. You enjoying that support? Well, a Liverpool man going for United and a United man going for Liverpool. <laughs> What's going on? Anyone else, you see? See anyone else featuring? I think Arsenal is strong. I think they'll be the main challengers. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And that's just about it. But for a match of the day, a sincere thank you to everyone at Norwich City Football Club, who were magnificent yesterday in helping us make some of our final preparations for a new opening for match of the day. The story of the FA Carling Premiership will start to unfold next Saturday. Hope you'll be able to join us. Good night. Next on BBC One Test Cricket with highlights of today's play at Edgbaston. And two exceptional goals. This is Giggs. Ince is in the centre. Cantona's joining him. Giggs again. Irwin outside. And Cantona. Lifting it back in. Oh, that's a typical volley by Mark Hughes. Manchester United take the lead. And Mark Hughes very much the sort of chance that he thrives on. Davis. Oh, right, was it? Oh, what a tremendous shot. Ian Wright equalises for Arsenal. And if Mark Hughes provided a typical goal at one end, then that flourish from Ian Wright was every bit as good. It might even have been better.
One all at 90 minutes and then one miss each during the penalty shootout before this bizarre conclusion as Arsenal's keeper David Seaman fancied his chances against Peter Schmeichel. He never misses in training. The champions take the charity shield, but uh, really very little to choose between United and Arsenal, the two favourites for the Premiership Championship. Well, Seaman had a great game, Bob, but the spot kick was a bit of a disaster, wasn't it? I would blame his coach personally. Who was his coach? He saved a penalty. Penalty saving. I had nothing to do with that. He really has so much confidence, Alan. Actually, you're one to speak because a little birdie told me that you were taking penalties at the beginning of the week. And I was highly pretty, impressed. Pretty successfully, I was, well, this is impressive. This Actually, is, you never lose it, do you? Now, that's impressive. That is impressive. But pressure's on now. What happens with this one, Alan? Well, somebody moves the goals here, I think. It's Clemens, Clemens and goals. You definitely move. Blame the referee. You should have taken it again. <laughs> OK, let's move away from the charity and the good phone. Let's I say you should put your money where your mouth is, and I do like a little flutter on the league championship at this stage of the proceedings. Liverpool at 6-1 to one strikes me as a very good value bet, the best price against the Anfield club, surely, for many years. It's also the last season of the cop before it's converted to seats, and those who've stood there for so many years will want to go out on a high note. So, with the team strengthened by the signings of Neil Ruddock and Nigel Clough, it's Liverpool for me for the championship. Well, at the risk of being a little perverse, I think the further Manchester United travel in Europe, the better their chance of retaining the league title. That's because it will justify the squad and heighten the ambition, particularly for Eric Cantona, the key player. Given the size and strength of Manchester United's squad, it's foolish to argue a case against them. But if the European campaign were to prove a distraction, then I'd fancy Aston Villa to go one better than last season. Well, I'm sure most clubs watching are doing so with trepidation because my past records of predictions isn't particularly impressive. But I think looking at European competitions, I've decided to steer clear of the clubs involved in those. So the two obvious candidates, Manchester United and Arsenal, aren't included. And for the same reason, not Aston Villa or Norwich. And so looking at the other clubs, I've decided for Sheffield Wednesday or Liverpool were the main two and I've plumped for Sheffield Wednesday. Manchester United are obvious favourites and with such good reason it's difficult to argue against them. My only reservation is the possible distraction of Europe. So I'm going to go for Aston Villa. They didn't quite get the trip last season but they still finished second. They've signed some good reinforcements, got a good manager, play good football. I'll go for Villa. Well as far as the title is concerned I think with Des Walk having signed for them I'm going to go for Sheffield Wednesday. Looking at their credentials, I think it'd take a fool to go against Manchester United and Arsenal. Well, here I am. I just think that the Liverpool boat might have stopped rocking at last. They signed a couple of very effective players during the summer. They have two or three more who were ineffective last year because of injury. And if you're looking for course and distance winners in the title race, they still have plenty in their team. I'll take Liverpool this time. Well, I wish you would ask me a difficult question. I mean, that one is so simple. Obviously, Manchester United proved themselves the best team last year, and they'll do it again. Well, we're listening, Jim. <laughs> Some <laughs> bad judges there, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I don't think people should put too much money on this, uh, Alan, but uh, two for Liverpool there, John Motts and Clive Tilsley. Two for Manchester United. I thought it might have been more, because they are so strong. Two for Sheffield Wednesday. They're one that I fancy as an outsider, certainly. And two for Villa. Time for you. Yeah, I think Manchester United, I think the Premier League's there for the taking for them, if they really want it. Alex Ferguson spoke last week about hunger. I think his only problem is to keep everybody happy. They've got a strong squad. The people that are on the bench last week in the charity shield, Robson, McClare, Sharp, they won't be happy, you know, being in the reserves for too long. And that would be the, his only problem as yeah, I see it. Yeah, I think it. that is a problem. Uh, I had a good time last season with Arsenal for the Cup and uh, Man United for the league, but I think Arsenal with a live North Bank and uh, George Graham going for a third championship. Do I sound yeah, biased? I well, I think, I think they've, they've got a great chance, Arsenal. They're very strong, but I want you to see the tape of that where you tipped them for the two cups last it's year. It's true, honestly, it's true. Let's have a look at the betting, Alan, here for the championship. I, as I say, I picked out Sheffield Wednesday. They're a very good bet at 16-1, to 1, and Leeds United probably better at 20-1. to 1. Yeah, two great each-way bets, but obviously Manchester United 15-8 are strong favourites. And then the next two would be my challenges, my main challenge is Arsenal and Liverpool. I think Liverpool are better balanced this season, and if they get off to a good start, then they'll be up there challenging Manchester United. Now, the, the other end, the outsiders, real outsiders here, do you, would you go along with this? I think so. I think most of those will be concentrating and not going down. Mm. I think they'll be happy to survive, most mm. of those sides. I think I gave you a little bit of... Uh, 
poor information when I said Duncan Ferguson. I told you Duncan Ferguson hadn't played. I think he played on Wednesday and scored the winning goal against Dumbarton. So he is Thanks on his way, Duncan Ferguson. Oh yeah, we've corrected that. Anyway, match of the day tonight. I'm sure you'll want to see that. It's 10.40 on BBC One. All this afternoon's goals and best action. Alan will be there with Trevor Brooking and Ray Stubbs introducing. And finally, just uh, on a new season as it begins, certainly in England, good luck to everyone this afternoon. Coventry, the player who did the damage was Mick Quinn. A first half penalty and two typical strikes in the second half helped Quinn to an opening day hat-trick. He's already backed himself at 50 to 1 to be the Premiership top scorer. Good evening. So, here we go, as they say. The new season is underway, and all over the country, football fans are hoping it's their turn for success. Match of the day. A year ago, Arsenal began the season with a surprise home defeat by Norwich. Today, Lee Dixon's challenge on Peter Undlove set the scene for another full start at Highbury. A penalty, no question, said referee Alan Wilkie. And for Mick Quinn, a good day was only just beginning. The second half, even better for Coventry. Weggerly with the vital back heel, despite Tony Adams' attention, Quinn irresistible. And three minutes later, an already miserable afternoon for Arsenal got even worse. Quinn's finishing, his manager later described as exquisite. Not the adjective usually attached to Mick Quinn, but at 50 to 1 to be the league's top scorer, perhaps he's not a bad bet. Last time I spoke to Andy was on Thursday, um, and I understand that he's basically uh, talked to one club, I believe it's Arsenal, and uh, I think he's probably taking the weekend or whatever to make up his mind. Um, you know, I can only hope that perhaps it all falls through and he stays here. Are you resigned to losing him? And if you are, well, how do you feel about that? Well, it looks like it, yeah, and I'm very disappointed um, and frustrated, really, but it's, it's, that's the way of uh, the smaller clubs, unfortunately. And um, obviously, uh, Andy wants to get on. Uh, he made that clear, you know, to the chairman and myself on Tuesday. And, um, you know, in, in this day and age, as a player, a former player, I can understand that uh, there are great rewards out there now for uh, families and for players and it's only a short career um, and I understand that situation but obviously as a manager of this club and obviously as supporters it's very disappointing. Interesting to see which club shirt has Sinton on the back of it next week Trevor but Villa looking and Peter did. Coventry 3-0 bad start for them well it's a shocker in a way because I mean they started last season the same in the same vein you know the couple of defeats so you know Arsenal had a big tip to win this premiership and uh, it was a terrible result for them yeah, really it's, it's... but you see what happened last year they bounced back with two cups so you can never tell but it's I mean it's early days it's like the, the first hole of the a major golf championship you know you can have a bogey but still win the, the trophy Though yeah. the feeling must be quite good there in Liverpool. We've got one up on them at so early on in the season. Well, that was a good result for Spurs yeah. on Saturday. Because, I mean, they've taken a right pound in Spurs. Most of it's self-inflicted, of course, at uh, board level. Mm -hmm. And Arsenal have sat back, quite rightly, smiling at the situation. So it was nice to get a little one-up for Tottenham on the first day. Back from Saturday's crushing defeat by Coventry and settled the first North London derby of the new season. Spurs heard... Hardly got a look in, but Wright had to wait until the 87th minute before heading the only goal of the game. Competing for a place against Poland in next week's World Cup qualifier. Arsenal's Ian Wright is favourite to lead the attack at Wembley. 
Uh, he's in action at Blackburn uh, this evening. Les Ferdinand of Queen's Park Rangers will need to be on target against Sheffield United at Loftus Road to hold off the challenge from Tottenham's Teddy Sheringham. He plays in the derby with Chelsea at White Hart Lane. The 76th minute goal from Kevin Campbell earned a draw for Arsenal at Blackburn Rovers. The final score, one all at Old Trafford. Both goals in Arsenal's 2-0 demolition of Everton were scored by Ian Wright, making it 61 in 85 games in an Arsenal shirt. And the new North Bank... ...with uh, Aston Villa's Earl Barrett behind him. Here's the uh, skipper, Stuart Pearce, and the irrepressible Ian Wright. Obviously a Bruce Lee fan. But of course, uh, Paul Gascoigne, he's never exactly a quieter squad member either, is he? But if ever the squad really needed to give each other some support, this game coming up against Poland is certainly the game. Well, Stuart... Please. ...to wait, Ian Wright chosen, but neither made the headlines in the meeting of Blackburn and Arsenal. Instead, the pacey Scott, Kevin Gallagher, was the first to lay claim. Blackburn's goal in the 36th minute. Shearer, in fact, didn't appear until the 53rd. And it wasn't Wright who scored Arsenal's equaliser, but Kevin Campbell, strong in the challenge and in the finish. Clear position after six games, five points behind Manchester United, who are now three points ahead of Arsenal. Uh, enjoying a private joke at the expense of Queen's Park Rangers, Les Ferdinand. And I must say, uh, there really is a terrific spirit within the whole of the squad. <laughs> Only one squad. Point for Next, uh, last Wednesday's much-heralded win at Wembley against Poland. Right. And here's Ferdinand! They lost them. It was well taken. He got between two markers and finished with a plum. The best challenge you'll ever see. And the uh, referee wants words. And shows the yellow card to Paul Gascoigne, which means that Gascoigne cannot play against Holland. Well, I wonder if he realises that himself now. I mean, it, it was an unnecessary challenge because it's deep in the Polish half. Don't have to go in on a tackle like this. And having seen the referee already book on a couple of occasions, he's paid the price. Three just outside the area. One of the three is Gascoigne. Well by Ferdinand, Gascoigne, yes! Wonderful header by Les Ferdinand. And the second goal comes. Ferdinand scored the first, undoubtedly set up the chance for the second by that huge climb. And Paul Gascoigne gets to the space and hits it cleanly with the right. Gascoigne and Stuart Pearce. Interesting position, one on the ball and one behind. Little touch, Pearce! Oh, yes! That's wonderful. But he's missed eight games for Stuart Pearce. He scored on his last appearance against Turkey and he now brings a smile to the face of Graham Taylor. This is some strike. What was the difference playing tonight from the performance in Oslo? What makes that sort of a difference? I mean, the, the atmosphere, the, the crowd getting behind us, it was, um, you know, uh, in, international. P playing two um, games in such a short space of time is always, always going to take a lot out of you. Obviously, it was a bad performance in Oslo and um, one we wanted to put right tonight. We knew we was better than what we, we played in, uh, in Norway. So how do you look ahead now? I mean, do you expect to qualify? Yeah, of course. Um, we've expected to qualify all along. Um, obviously, we've had a few bad results, but you know the lads have always felt confident and feel that we will qualify. And as far as the manager was concerned, I mean, was that performance for the manager as much as for everybody else? Of course, yeah. You know, it, it, a lot of bad, bad press. He's had a lot of bad press, a lot of bad things said about him, and it's mainly been down to us. You know, so you know, it's up to us to put that right. We knew the boss was under a little bit of pressure. We needed a result this evening, so. 
the squad are as pleased to get that result for him as they are themselves, I believe. And looking ahead now? Well, it's that one game at a time uh, thing again, you know. We've won the first game, we've got to go into Holland now, keep the positive approach and, and get a result. For me, personally, uh, you know, I prove everyone I am fit and I am hopefully back to what I want to be. And that's near my best, uh, it's just a shame. I got booked, uh, I missed the Holland game now, that's if, if selected. Um, I miss it and I was really, I'm really gutted because that is probably the most important match that England will ever play for a long time and uh, I'm not going to be part of it but hopefully I'll be there in the dressing room getting the lads on. At the book and I don't know if you, well, you know the polls were diving all about, keep crying and mourning um, and unfortunately when I, when I kicked the guy I got the ball first and it was the fact that he mourned and rolled, I, that's the reason I got booked but that's international football. And uh, you know, I should have learned through my experience not to have done that. So I was upset a little bit in that way. I only plead and hope to God that uh, you know, come the the 13th of October, that the guys are on song again, and no doubt they will do and get a fantastic result for England. With two points and a really fine performance by his team behind him, it was a relaxed and very contented Graham Taylor who arrived for Thursday's post-match press conference. And the England manager was quite happy to face many of those who have consistently vilified him previously, and he put all the credit his players' way. In my opinion, Les Ferdinand has got what it takes to be a very good international player. But Les himself has to decide now whether he really does want it. And by that I mean that there are times when he can go out of games, there are times when he can drift and not impose himself on the game. If Les himself decides that he's now at the peak, 25, 26 years of age, that I have got now what it takes, I'm going to impose myself on every game, club or international, he becomes a handful. He'll always have indifferent games because everybody has those. But I think it's there for Les now to decide himself, not for Jerry Francis, not for Graham Taylor to decide for him, but for Les Ferdinand to decide. Another plus, your captain, Stuart Pearce, came back. He surprised me afterwards. He said he didn't think he had a, a very good game. <laughs> About taking the mickey out of you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Stuart did very well. I, um, Stuart is going to have to live with the fact that at the present time, Nottingham Forest are in the first division. Therefore, the easy line is to say, well, he's playing a standard below what he should be playing. He can't be as fit. and That's the easy line. And Stuart Pearce, though, when he puts on that England shirt, he gives a feeling to the public, which, in a different kind of way, Gascoigne shows it, but Pearce, he gives it in this way, a steely determination. Nobody's going to mess about with me, or my England colleagues, or my England manager. And your new partnership in the heart of the defence. Some people worried that there was a sameness about the, the, these two. <coughs> I, think they, I think they probably do that, because both boys are you know, were well in excess of six foot, and they wonder. Now, Gary Pallister's very quick. See, if, uh, people underestimate how quick Pallister is. He covers the ground extremely quick. He very rarely gets outrun. And Tony Adams is an experienced player. He's a leader player. I think that Tony, by having this run in the international side, I think people begin to realize that we all look upon Tony as the sort of league type centre half, I'll head it away, I'll kick it away, I'll kick them now and again, that, that kind of... But he's a far better footballer than people give him credit for. He's had to go through a period of time where he had a label on him, so therefore when he slices a ball, which everybody does now and again, when he miscues one, then he has all of that chanting at him, so it gives a label on him which is not a true label. Paul Gascoigne justified your faith in him, that's a plus. The minus is he won't be there in Holland. No, I mean, those people are now saying that he shouldn't have played and shouldn't have even been in the squad, some were suggesting. We'll now get the opportunity to see what that means uh, when we play against Holland. Let's hope that we you don't, ha don't have to pay a full price for that. But Paul himself, the one thing I hope uh, about Paul Gascoigne is that the season doesn't sort of taper away for him as last season did. So I'm not surprised that he had his... Uh, full 90 minutes. Uh, I went on the evidence of what I've seen with my own eyes and yes, I know there's been 9 or 10 games, I, I'm told, at Lazio when he's been substituted, but that's Lazio's decision. It's not my decision, it's not ours. And he was ready for a full 
uh, 90 minutes. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. If you, keep, if you keep getting substituted, you know, you do start to question yourself. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Gascoigne or anyone else. You don't want people starting questioning themselves. So it was important for him, as much as it was for England, and I think for Lazio as well, that he played the full 90 minutes. And he showed he was capable of doing that. We talked about the, the danger of euphoria, too much euphoria. Is there also a danger of overestimating Holland? People still think of Holland oh, as the Holland of, the, of Cruyff yes. of the 70s. Yeah. I mean, only time will tell. Why is it that we ourselves have received a, a heavy degree of criticism for a record that now shows four wins, three draws and one defeat? And we're being told that Holland are an exceptional side who at the moment, as I'm talking to you, have three wins, three draws and one defeat. The one defeat being against Norway, which was our defeat. They've drawn at home to Poland. They've drawn at home with Norway, which we did. And yet we're consistently being told that, you know, this is a, a different, this is a special side. They've been having their problems in qualifying, such as ourselves. Now, I know that if we go to Holland and we win, then we really are in a driving seat because we've then got to go to San Marino, get our result, and we're there. Finally, how's the manager going to deal with all these people saying nice things about him? <laughs> Difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Not used to that. <laughs> he deserves a little smile there, I must say. Uh, his captain, Stuart Pearce, I think revealed as much as anything when he said, uh, we knew the boss was under a little pressure. <laughs> yeah, I think that epitomises the life of the manager this week. I saw him on last Sunday in an interview, and he looked very tense, and understandably so. There was a lot on it. Everybody was unsure about the result. It was the nerves were, were, were creeping in. He's got to rely a lot on himself, but more on other people. And there, all of a sudden, we get a great result, and he does a terrific interview. So they sensed He's it. relaxed. They He's relaxed. Yeah, they sensed it. They, 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 they knew. They know in the dressing room with the manager, like he knows how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows, you know, you're stripped of all those camouflages when you go into the dressing room. Who most impressed you on Wednesday? Uh, Ince impressed me the most. I thought he'd done an excellent job. Um, I think that's been one of Graham's problems, where he wants to play um, Platt and Gascoigne, and at the same time, where do you put Ince? Ince, that's his job. And then he's got to put Platt on the right, which it, he's, he's, he's done a good disciplined job. At the same time, natu his natural instinct to follow the, vo the ball vacates his area at times. But nevertheless, it worked, and it worked well. And I thought uh, from the first ten minutes, you, you, you knew the result. So the match in Holland, uh, any changes other than the obvious no Paul Gascoigne. Well, um, he's, he's, he's very confident with the team. He's pleased with what they've done, and I would say wouldn't make any changes. Um, his problem is, of course, you say Gascoigne. It gives a chance for Platt to go into his position and get forward to score goals. And with Sharp on the left, he's got to have someone on the right who's going to tuck in. And, um, have you got somebody in mind? Well, funny enough, I've all, I, I believe uh, that Trevor Stephen, who played in the semi-final against Germany, um, when we did so well there, it is, is the best at that job, at tucking in, and he knows it, and he's experienced, we need an experienced man, and he's not even 30 yet. Yeah. That surprised me. That's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting bit of result, Terry? Result, I think we'll get a draw. I think we'll get a draw. Which could be enough. That could, hopefully. Yeah, well, England's fate uh, very much in there. They beat West Ham United this afternoon at Ewood Park. <laughs> Manchester United and Arsenal, remember, meeting at Old Trafford tomorrow. Well, Mike, uh, you said to me that really it takes up to October for the uh, championship to sort of take shape, but um, who are the best sides you've seen? Well, the best I've seen, I think, is uh, probably Blackburn Rovers so far. I mean, obviously, Manchester United have got all that strength and depth, and I wouldn't for one minute doubt their credentials, you know, to go up. But uh, looking at Blackburn, um, I was very impressed with them the other night at Liverpool. Um, considering the way the game went, they kept their heads, they played within reason, and they played well. Um, we played them early in the season, played very well, and they've come on again since then. Um, Arsenal, I mean, I've not seen them live again, seen them on the television, have, have looked as if they're quite strong, especially the other the, the win against Ipswich. But I have to say, one of the best performances I've seen, actually seen on the day, was Newcastle Ipswich. I thought they were magnificent, mm. and uh, to only get a draw, it was a, it was a bit of a travesty, really. But uh, I think you're going to find uh, Manchester United, Arsenal, Blackburn. Okay. One way or another, it's been uh, quite a week in Scotland, notably on the international front, first with a change of management. At four stitches in a gashed head after a freak accident, he didn't train in goal today. David, I understand your head has had a <laughs> collision with something. What happened? Yeah, that's right. Um, I did it yesterday morning, just as I was packing to come here. I've uh, 
put my bags in the car and the window cleaners parked his van next door to me and I've just walked straight into his ladders that were on the roof of his van, you know, and just caught the top of my head and my eye. No problems though in training? Um, it was sore this morning, you know, I, I went straight to the hotel yesterday, I had some, I had four stitches in the top one, you know, just a bit of plaster on the other. Uh, but, you know, it was sore this morning, so I just did a light bit of training. Uh, it should be alright for tomorrow. And so you've got rid of all the bad luck for this week? <laughs> I hope so, yeah. At least I didn't go under it. <laughs> <laughs> now, David Platt in good form, having scored four goals for his new club Sampdoria in Italy this season. David Platt, well, he's an even more important character, given the uh, absence of Paul Gascoigne. Whichever way you look at it, one of us is going to be one step closer to the, the United States, and one of us is going to be one step further back and looking for a miracle. Is this the decisive game, then, really? I think you can look at it that way. I mean, we'll never know up until the, the group's finished, but at the end of the day, I would say yes. Um, the last game against Poland a month ago was obviously decided because if we hadn't have won the game, then we wouldn't have been talking in the same breath as we are about this one. But we won that game 3 0, and we deserve to win it. Um, if we can produce the same form and the same determination, I see no reason why we can't go to Rotterdam and get the right result there. But whichever way you look at it, if we was to win, draw, or lose, um, it looks as though then that's, this game is going to sort out who goes. Obviously, if we win, we'll more or less have qualified for the, for the United States. If we were to draw, I think we remain the favourites. And losing, then we're looking for a miracle. And the same with the Dutch and the other way. So the players with plenty to think about, so too the fans, because uh, Home Secretary Michael Howard has warned the England fans that they face prosecution if they misbehave in Holland for that World Cup qualifier in Rotterdam on Wednesday. He supported the Dutch authorities who have promised to clamp down on hooligans. Mr Howard said, I want anyone who misbehaves to receive the full force of the law, arrest, charge, conviction and punishment. The uh, message to the England fans travelling to Rotterdam on Wednesday. Strangely muted atmosphere. David Seaman even miming a yawn in the direction of the Norwich supporters, even trying to G them up a bit. Nothing resembling a clear chance really at either end. Even Anders Limpar, whose inclusion provoked the biggest cheer of the afternoon, failing to lift the gloom of the occasion. A Merson shot a foot wide, then Ian Wright a moment ago. A couple of Norwich free kicks, the nearest we've had to a goal. Things can only improve. Trafford won't improve Highbury tempers. Norwich, you suspect, will be happy with a second draw in a week here. A first half short on chances, short on inventiveness, short on passion, really just about everything. Ian Wright eventually creating a minor alarm in the Norwich defence, a run and deflection, palm clear by Brian Gunn. At the other end, Arsenal only under pressure from a couple of free kicks. A better second half marginally, Anders Limpar restored today, setting up a chance that neither Smith, Paul Davis nor Ian Wright could force home. A good save in truth by Gunn. Late on, Ian Crook clearing off the line from Tony Adams, even if he didn't know much about it. But both sides looking for inspiration and not finding it with just over two minutes to go. It is Arsenal nil, Norwich City nil. And Norwich and Arsenal, of course, they were in second place jointly already. Nice stretch, their lead at the top of the Premiership to a massive 11 points after Norwich City and Arsenal fought out a goalless draw at Highbury today. The second in the Premiership at Highbury and Arsenal's goal famine continues. Three successive goalless draws in the league before today and now it's four. Tony Adams frustrated there by Ian Crook's block. Norwich seemed happy with a second Highbury draw this week but quite how they kept Arsenal out late on remains something of a mystery. In injury time, the deadlock's so near to being broken, but you know Ian Wright's luck is out as well. Arsenal have gone through the whole of October without a Premiership goal. And who knows, maybe in tomorrow's press we might see uh, a few headlines, which is unlikely. Unlucky Arsenal. I mean, you know, that would be an event. Top of the table tonight, today's win for Manchester United leaves them 11 points clear, the biggest ever leading margin in the top flight at this stage of the season. Well, Arsenal Mill, if you stay up, we'll show you those goals later in the programme. It's tonight, Blackburn remains second following Aston Villa's defeat by Southampton. Newcastle's 4-0 win over Sheffield United. Director of coaching...